First, I want to thank Serge for the invitation to be here. Uh, I was here in the 30th anniversary, and I'm here in the 40th, and we're going to be here too in the 50th anniversary. So, uh, get ready. Uh, I was also here as advisor, international advisor, for several years, that, you know, and that kind of uh, helped me to to know better sex, and I, I can with testify that there's, you know, I don't think there's anything like such uh, in Europe for sure, and probably in the rest of the world, maybe a few more places, but I don't think there's anything like such, you know. Uh, so, uh, and I wanted also to, to say something I put in writing, Aventura, you know this, that I always say that after Jean Paul Sartre, there has not been a single European intellectual with the commitment for liberation struggles in the global south than Boaventura and Sosa Santos. And I would say that the comparison is wrong because contrary to Sartre, you took seriously the epistemologies of the South in a way that Sartre never did. So I just wanted to acknowledge that once again in front of you, although I put that already in writing, and uh, thank you for all the decades of work and solidarity that you have put forward, and for the you know, greatness of this institute such in terms of uh, the struggles of the global South. Uh, I would like to, um, be, you know, I would like to to put in question mark the, the issue about the crisis we're living today. It's a big crisis, but I would like to put in question mark the crisis of the left, <laughs> because I think that in focusing a lot on where we are and the rise of fascism, extreme right, all of that, we we forget what brought us there, okay, what are the, the failures of us, you know, from the left. And I know Bob Turis was coming with a book about this question, we'd love to read it soon, uh, but this is, I think, a central question of our times, okay, how are we going to rebuild or refine what we call the left? Because we are in a, in a serious crisis, you if you look at the correlation of the rise of the extreme right and, and neo-fascism today, there is a correlation between having had eight, ten years of left governments and then suddenly uh, having their, you know, in an abrupt way and surprising way to many of us, the rise of extreme right and fascism. So we need to go into our own self-critical, what are we doing wrong? You know, what is it that is happening that after so many years of left wing or left, let's put it this way, uh, governments who, progressive governments, or, you know, why we end up, you know, there, you know, with extreme right figures and stuff like that. So uh, one thing that happened with fascism and to use the language of Boaventura, is that fascism breaks the rules of the Abyssal line. What I mean by that is, Abyssal line usually has some kind of stable line, you know, of people above, people below. Uh, we usually forget one part of your work on the Abyssal line. We, we mention Abyssal line almost like a mantra now, but we don't forget that the part where you say that in above the line, or what Fanon calls the zone of being, you know, I have written something, put it in conversation about Ventura and Fanon on this question of this line, line of the human, that kind of thing. And uh, what Ventura says, in above the line, the way the system manages conflicts is through regulation and emancipation. Below the line, is violence and dispossession, right? This, we always talk about Islam, Islam, we forget this point, which I think is central 
for the understanding of the moment we live because the abyssal line, the methods the system use to uh, manage the conflicts, that line where violence goes fundamentally to certain groups and regulation emancipation to other groups, that line become, let me put it this way, it goes up and covers some of the groups that used to be above the line, suddenly they are fascists and pass them below the line. And suddenly they start leaving a violence and, and dispossession, okay? Uh, some groups that used to be stable, stable but they are suddenly they are passed below. This is what fascism does. Fascism pushed the line to places that used to be comfortable because they were not living under the regime of violence and dispossession. And suddenly, they open their eyes and they have violence and dispossession going against them. Okay, so I think we need to think about this, this, uh, this question because we're going to see, and uh, we're seeing now, uh, more and more people that used to be stable above the line suddenly push below <laughs> in terms of uh, neoliberal policies, dispossession and violence. Okay, so and I think this will become more and more going, you know, more progressing as the fascism keeps, you know, in a sense uh, moving forward in, in some of the countries they are already uh, taking power. Okay? So uh, that will put us in a different context of politics. You see, in terms of how can we build a politics, you know, from the below the abyssal line, that in a sense put coalition, broader coalition that before they used to be in that zone of the zone of non-being. But we're going to see a lot of sectors that used to be uh, uh, antagonistic to the zone of non-being that suddenly are now in the zone of non-being and will be. Uh, have at least the potential, okay? I didn't say automatically they're going to be allies, but have the potential to become allies of the struggle against fascism. But anyway, uh, I want to focus on two questions. One question is, if you think about the question of why, what happened with many of the left governments, uh, is that in a sense, uh, you have, there is a saying of a, the, the French fascist, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, you know, who always say, don't go for the photocopy, go for the original. Okay? And what he's, he means by that, and this is very significant, we need to, to, to listen to this carefully, to this slogan of Le Pen, what he's saying is that how the left have moved so much to the right well, when they come to power, okay, maybe under electoralist logics that maybe I want to be reelected and then I don't want to antagonize people, you know, the power structures, you see, and then suddenly you move so much to the right that you become the photocopy. And then comes the fascists and say, hey, we are the original. We will do it even better than them and in a, 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 a larger scale than what they do. So we're going to be, we are the ones you should be voting for, okay? And you look at social democracy, for example, in Europe, it's like, you know, what's the difference between what they do and some of the extreme right policies, uh, especially when, you, when it comes down to xenophobia, racism, Etc. So if you, when you're in power, you don't change the subjectivity of the people. If you don't interrupt the, the institutions of domination while you're there, okay, at least interrupt them. Even if you're not going to maybe be able to solve them, but if you don't interrupt them, if you don't change the subjectivity of the people, don't be surprised if you become the photocopy and the original comes after you. Okay? Because in a sense, you're not interrupting the policies and you're just following the straight line moving to the right. And when you open your eyes, you have you have become just a photocopy. You don't have anything to fight back. You don't have anything in your discourse or in your 
practices that will show something significantly different. And then on top of that, you practice neoliberalism. I mean, that's the, a, a, a fatal combination. And then you practice neoliberalism, and then you are dispossessing the traditional people who vote for the left. Okay, so suddenly you have whole population that used to be voting for leftist parties of the working classes that suddenly are voting now for extreme right. You know, that happened in Europe, but that's happened also in Brazil. In, in many places we see this move that we say, what, what happened here? These people in the last election were massively voting for the left. Now suddenly they're voting for the extreme right. Okay? So working classes. So what's going on? So I think we need to have some critical view of what is it that the left is doing when they come to positions of power. You know, to what extent the policies are not really addressing the inequalities and the problems of domination, exploitation, etc. And you basically become a photocopy, you know, after that and then the battle is lost. Okay? Uh, then the other question I want I want to address as a and this is where I want to do my most of my, my presentation, is that I think that part, not all, but part of the, the central part of the problem of the left is the, the paradigms through which the left traditionally have been working. Okay? And I'm going to decolonize those paradigms. We need to decolonize the paradigm through which the left have been working, uh, you know, since the 19th century on to today. So one of the problems I see is that we need to decolonize the paradigms of political economy. We need to, uh, in a sense, identify uh, the cartography of power. In a sense, I'm going to do, in a sense, to use Valentino's language now in my presentation, a kind of sociology of absences, okay, to later be able to talk about sociology of emergences. In, I, I will say, Valentino, the more I read your different writings on this question, I see like you being like, it becomes more and more clear that these two things go together. That is that sociology of absences is fundamental to have the social of emergencies, you know. Uh, before, in the early moment you were articulating this, for, at least for me, it didn't become that clear as it is now in writing that these two things are like linked together uh, in, a, in a very strong way. Uh, before, you know, I, I kind of understood social of absences and emergencies as kind of separate. Now I can see that there is like a, a connection that is very strong. Maybe it's my failure in reading you. But anyway, uh, uh, so, so the, what I'm going to do now is sociology of absences, to use the language. Uh, so what I see is that the paradigms of political economy are constructed under the vision and the perspective of people above the abyssal line. That is, in my, I used to be a professor at SUNY Binghamton, and I used to work with Emmanuel Wallerstein, Giovanni Ari, the, the greatest thinkers of the, of the political economy and the world system. And I, I used to be a professor there, but to be honest, I sat down in the courses as a student, and it didn't miss a single class of these people, because they are great teachers, great thinkers. But in my ways with them, one of the things I, I, I usually ask them is why is it that when you think about the, the world system or the global system, you only see an economic system? Okay? Why is it that you don't see anything else? The rest, in any case, is superstructure. It's a phenomenon. It's derivative. And the answer they gave me was, which was quite interesting, they were saying, you know, Ramon, in the European colonial expansion, 
Uh, after 1492, uh, the only thing new was this economic system with a logic of capital accumulation on a world scale. Okay? Because the rest is not new. The rest was already there in Europe. So what about the rest? Uh, like forms of proto-racism or raciology, forms of Christian patriarchy, uh, forms of uh, you know Christian dom as a structure you know that was moving in the European colonial expansion to different parts of the world, uh, forms of thinking of the relationship between human beings and other forms of life. Uh, forms about thinking the relationship between human beings, etc. Et Many things, uh, aesthetics, the way to think about aesthetics, the way to think, all these things, they say, well, this was already in Europe. And therefore, the only new thing is this system of capitalist accumulation at the world scale. And I, I was shocked by that, by that answer because they were assuming kind of commonsensical that local European history is war history. That what happened locally in Europe was happening in America, was happening in Africa, was happening everywhere the Europeans arrived. Right? So uh, so I told them, well wait a minute, that's the words of the Eurocentrism. When you think that local European history is war history. So you are uh, uh, falling into a trap here. Because if you think about the Americas, indigenous civilizations, uh, and you see the same European expansion, not from the point of view of the uh, above the abyssal line, that is Europe expanding somewhere, but if you see Europe from the <coughs> below the abyssal line, Europe arriving, you get a different picture. That is, when you look at Europe arriving, Suddenly, what arrives is not an economic system. It's a civilization with a package, a broad package of power relations that are not exhausted only in economics. And by the way, the economics are already organized from within with the civilizational logics. Okay? So, of this system. So I, I, will, I was basically thinking, and that, that reminded me to basically think that world systems or global systems that they used to be seen as economic systems, I see them as civilizations. Uh, we need to decolonize in that sense from where are we looking at the same system. If you look at it above the abyssal line, you're only going to see fundamentally an economic system that expands. But if you, you take the other side, change the geography of reason, and look at it from the below the abyssal line, then you're going to get a broader picture of a broad package of power relations that came together with the European colonial expansion. Remember, they came with the cross, they came with the sword, they, they came with a, a package, a broad package of power relations are not just economic, okay? So, if that's the case, if we're talking about the expansion of civilizational expansion, okay, there are several consequences. One of the consequences is that our cartography of power has to account for the multiplicity of power relations, okay, that cannot be just saying economic, you know, accumulation of capital, and that's it. You need to account for racism, you need to account for as, as power structure of the world system, that is of the global system, you need to account for Eurocentrism, for Christianocentrism, you need to account for, uh, uh, you know, the, the ways of thinking of the relationship between uh, human life and other forms you know, of, of being, you know, of, of life, non-human forms of life, you want to call it, we need to account for a, for a big package of things that are constitutive, not superstructure, but constitutive of historical capitalism. 
When I say historical capitalism, I'm, I'm saying the, the real existing capitalism. You remember in the, in the 20th century when we, people used to say real existing socialism? We need to kind of come back to that, but with capitalism. The real existing capitalism, not the one we imagine, not the abstract one, the real existing capitalism, okay? And the real existing capitalism is the economic system of the civilization. That is, it's not an independent unit, and it's not even, I would say, the point of departure. That is, what we call capitalism is already organized from within with the civilization logics that were expanded with Europe to other parts of the world. Now, that civilization, European civilization, whatever it was at the time, that was the we were European here, is problematic because at the moment it was built really, the Pancho was, I don't know, the, the, the Castilian the Christian monarchy, okay? And at that moment the identity of Europe was not there, it came later. So, that implies that that civilization, Christian, you know, you know, Christian civilization, you want to call it uh, in the east side of Eurasia, okay, you want to use that, those terms, uh, that expanded first to the conquest of Al Andalus in the south of what we call today Spain, uh, later to the Americas and later to other parts of the world, Africa, Asia, and all over the world, until the early 19th century. Of the early 20th century, when finally they covered the whole planet. Now, that European expansion is a civilizational expansion, but usually in the Marxist narratives, we think of it as just an economic expansion, and we think of it as an economic expansion that goes elsewhere, and then uh, basically the narrative goes as far, which I don't deny, goes to other parts of the world to. Uh, impose coerced labor and then super exploit labor elsewhere. But in fact, what was happening with this European, European civilizational expansion uh, is that it was a destruction of civilization. This is a part of the, of the narrative that gets lost or gets wasted in the, in, the, in the narratives, in the hegemonic narratives of the left. We should, because we think of economic expansion, all we see is that this system goes elsewhere, exploit labor, enslave people, etc. That's it. And we don't see that this civilization is destroying the rest of the civilization existing at the time. To the point that by the early 20th century, there's no more civilizations outside this planetary, modern, European, Western civilization that already have colonized the planet, so everybody is within. There's no exteriority to it, okay? In the sense of the political economy, I mean, okay? There are many exteriorities in other ways, but in the, in the sense of the global system, uh, there's no exteriority in the sense that in the sense we're all within, and of course from below there are contestation, there are struggles, there are spaces that question those payment logics, etc. And you have documented that very well in your work about the, the alternative economies in different parts of the world, you know, that are also emerging as social emergencies that emerge in different parts of the world, that you cannot think of it as something completely subsuming okay, what's happening. But in fact, this is the hegemonic uh, global system that in a sense is, uh, is, is with a strong force and these other initiatives coming from below are still in a weak position to challenge in a radical way that global system, okay? So, uh, so the point I'm trying to say is that we are talking about a civilization that expands and in the process of expanding, it can transform itself because it's not, it began as a Christian uh, East Eurasia, a civilization that goes with the Portuguese and Spaniards, first 15th century to Africa, then uh, you know uh, 15th century Al Andalus, Congress of Al Andalus, and then to the Americas in the late 15th century, 16th century. You know, so when you look at this, uh, we're talking about a civilization expansion that is destroying other civilizations wherever they go, and 
Uh, and then in that process, that civilization that began as a Christian Dom uh, East Eurasian civilization got transformed itself. Okay? So it's a process, a process that goes back and forth. Okay? Uh, and it became what we know today as modern, the modern world of modernity. Or, and what I'm trying to say is that modernity is a civilizational project. Modernity is not an emancipatory project. It depends from which side of the abyssal line you look at it. Okay? You look at it from above, of course you're going to see emancipation. If you look at it from below, you're going to see a civilization of death. Okay? Now, the, the, the debate with Eurocentric thinking is which is more important to define the system we live? The experience of 20, 50 percent of humanity in the above the abyssal line? Or the experience of 80, 85 percent of humanity who are below the abyssal line? And if we're going to take seriously the people below the abyssal line who are, happen to be the majority of the planet, and the people about the office of line, the privilege they get with regulation responsibility, thanks to the super exploitation below the abyssal line, then we cannot come back to the Eurocentric definitions of the system. That is, the way we've been defining the system is from the point of view of the left above the abyssal line. Okay? We're not taking into consideration, is in a sense, the critical thinking of the left below the abyssal line, the critical thinkers. That they all talk about civilization. If you look at the indigenous thinkers, if you look at critical black thinkers, for example, MSSN is a good example, they're talking always about the civilization. And in a sense, the economic system, <coughs> historical capitalism, is the economic system of a civilization. That is, uh, is already organized from within with the civilizational logics of modernity. So colonialism is the mechanism for expanding this civilization, destroying all the others, imposing this one everywhere, okay? And now we cannot say the West is over there. The West is <laughs> within us, okay? There is a, 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 there is a, a zone of being, you know, there is a north in the south and a south in the north, like what I always remind us. So, so, in a sense, and the West is inside all of us, in our subjectivity, in our identities, in our way of thinking, etc. So, decolonizing the West implies. A targeting a civilization and not just an economic system. This, this has theoretical implications for what I just said. For example, theoretically, if capitalism is genocidal, if capitalism is ecologicidal, if capitalism is feminicidal, epistemicidal, it's, it's not just because it has an edge of having profits in everything they do. Yes, that's there. But that's not enough to understand that. It's because it's organized from within with racist logics that are genocidal. It's organized with, with, from within with Eurocentric logics that are epistemicidal. It's organized from within with patriarchal Christian non-logics that is feminicidal. It's organized from within with a dualistic cosmological Cartesian logics that is ecologicidal. So, we cannot delink capitalism, the way we do our paradigms, from the civilizational logics of modernity. The civilizational logics of modernity organize capitalism from within. <coughs> okay? And so, so, in a sense, just to give you an example, the Every technology has cosmology. Okay? There's no technology without a cosmology. Okay? Uh, 
the technology, the cosmology that has produced technology in historical capitalism for the past 400 years is Cartesian dualism. Okay? The dualism of you know, human life and nation. No, human, they say man, nation, right? It's very patriarchal because woman is on the side of nature. But to talk in, the, in, the, in, in a non patriarchal way, in, to talk in a non patriarchal way, this we need to talk about either humans and other forms of life, right? But the problem is that if you think in your cosmology that those forms of life are exterior to human life, right? And that human life do not depend on those other forms of life because you have conceived ontologically an ontological difference between the human and other forms of non-human forms of life, okay? Then in the production of technology, you have put there the rationality of destruction of life. Because if you destroy those other forms of life, in your cosmology, you think it won't affect human life or life in general, because you have conceived it on, in an ontological dualistic structure. You see? And all the technology produced by capitalism is already a Cartesian dualistic conception that is destructive of life in planet Earth. So it's not only that capitalism has this edge of doing pure, making profits, it also has no limits in terms of destruction because cosmologically speaking, it has assumed the Cartesian dualistic uh, structure. So if you think about previous civilization with all the critics, problems, etc., that we can discuss, you know, uh, uh, ad nauseum here, uh, all the things that we have, no civilization in the past had the destructive structure that had this one. Because all of them were working on the heuristic cosmologies that always conceive life in relation to all forms of life inside one cosmos. They never thought in no civilization in the past had the stupidity of thinking that our own dualistic ontological Cartesian structure and building technology based on that. Nobody in the past ever, no civilization had that stupid idea. Uh, in the past, they were all, with all the problems, they were all using heuristic concepts. Pachamama, Tawit, Ubuntu, uh, etc. So other, no other concepts that were informing the production of technology. Okay? So look at how this discussion that seems to be like a stupid philosophical discussion, look at the consequences that this has for life in, in planet Earth, okay? Because if we don't decolonize from these uh, dualistic structures and bring back heuristic structures in the way of producing technology, we we'll just have the days counted, okay, in planet Earth. And so what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that in that sense, decolonization is not an option. It's a necessity. If we don't decolonize from these things, we have the days counted, okay? This is a, you know, a, it, it has an end, okay? And it has an end for human life and other forms of life, okay? And, and, and so what I'm trying to say is that, theoretically speaking, capital, historical capitalism has all these problems because it's already organized, not as a superstructure, but as kind of structuring logic of the way capitalism exists. <laughs> so, colonialism puts together economic system with the civilization of logic. So I see colonialism as that mechanism that destroys all the civilization and brings in these other logics that, in a sense, entangle civilization logics with an economic system. Now, this has political consequences. And this is what I want to discuss now. Political consequences this has is that 20th century socialism thought that by transforming the economy, they thought like, like I described early on the world system theory, that it was you know, a, a, an economic system, and that's it, the rest is just superstructure that will be solved once the economic system is solved, right? And the idea was if we move and destroy that economic system, then the rest will be solved. And we already have the laboratory of 20th century socialism to know 
the, the limit of the panel. The, to know that by the story of economy, you know, trying to transform it, you're not going to transform, not only you're not going to change all these other logics, civilizational logics, like racism, patriarchy, egocentrism, Christian law, etc., but you're going to not even solve what that's happened to the century socialists. They didn't even solve what they proposed to solve, which was the economic system. Why? Because historical capitalism is the economic system of the civilization. And so if you organize against capital, reproducing racist logics, Christian logics, patriarchal Christian logics, eh, eh, ecologicidal logics, like eh, eh, dualism of Cartesian, and so on, when you open your eyes, you're reproducing again everything you're fighting against. Um, because the system, historical capitalism, is already organized with the same logics that civilizational logics, and it's entangled and uh, mixed up with it. And so the, the issue is that if we don't decolonize from this, uh, and we keep repeating the paradigm of 20th century socialism, thinking that by changing the economic system, that will be enough. Uh, we're going to just repeat again everything we're fighting against, which is what happened in many ways with 20th century socialism. So I'm calling for decolonizing the paradigms under which the left have been working, okay, because those paradigms are already poisoned by the civilizational logics of modernity, that from the point of view of 80% of humanity beyond the abyssal line, there are logics of destructive logics of death uh, in the planet Earth, okay? So, so what I'm trying to, to so I'm calling for, 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 for this discussion and debate, because if we don't have the decolonization of our paradigms, uh, we run the risk of repeating again all the problems of, that we're fighting against, okay? Uh, and so, uh, to finish, if you remember, and this is culture habit in Venezuela and places I, I go, if you remember Northern Centric Socialism used to say that Part of changing that economic system, because they will only focus on that, and that's why all of them ended in state capitalist structures, because they were not addressing the multiplicity of logics of domination that were constituted in capitalism, so they were reproducing capitalism in the name of anti capitalism. Okay? So, uh, so, in a sense, the, 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 part of the theory was that if you develop the productive forces, you remember that theory. If you develop the productive forces, people are going to uh, leave a material growth and material, uh, you know, uh, betterment of, of the people, and and uh, uh, people will uh, automatically their consciousness will become, uh, in a sense, beyond capitalism. You produce the new, the hombre nuevo, no? The new man, that was the theory at the time, no? New man is very problematic, it's also a patriarchal uh, language, no? But they, that was, that's the way they express themselves, the new man produced through development of productive forces. If you read Marx, Marx always said, that, I'm, I'm going to finish on this, Marx always said that a productive force was not just the technology, it was the culture of the workers. So you need to change the culture of the workers. You know, if you leave that intact, and you think that automatically people are going to change values, attitudes, consciousness by more technology, more consumption, more material goods, which was a Stalinist model in 20th century, imitated by everybody, uh, to fall into traps. But if you look at southern centric socialist debates, if you look at this, a lot of the thinkers of, and leaders of, of the National Liberation Movement and Socialism in the, in the Global South, like someone like Che Guevara, someone like even Mao, even uh, with all the critics, problems, etc., they were calling attention to the, uh, 
to a cultural revolution. That is, we need to change our values, we need to change our culture, we need to change our attitudes, we need to change. It's not going to happen automatically by productive forces, technological growth. If you need human beings are not machines. This was the assumption of Northern-centric socialism. Human beings as machines, the Cartesian model again. And what they were calling for was, no, just material good that's not going to make it because people are going to carry on attitudes, values from the whole society and they're going to just reproduce again everything you're fighting against. So you need to have a, trans a radical transformation in the subjectivity of the people to move forward, okay? So from the point of view of the global South, South and Socialism, this is another point that I think we need to think in the places where they are in a position to, to take like Venezuela, other places that they have this. We need to think critically about this. One of the problems Venezuela is facing is this, that by, or like Nima was saying before, how a lot of poor people came to be in the classes, okay? There was no transformation in their subjectivity, okay? And I would say in Venezuela, then what you're doing from the left is creating many little Frankensteins. Remember Frankenstein? Frankenstein, it, it, that movie, the myth of Frankenstein. He was this entity that this scientist gave, gave, gave him life, and then when he woke up, he, he, went, he, he killed the scientist. He didn't say, oh, thank you, you gave me life. He killed the scientist. So if the left brings to more consumption, more material goods, a lot of poor people out of poverty will turn them into middle classes with the same values of the system, don't be surprised if they go for the renal next time and not for the photocopy. Thank you.